Okay, um, before I go to the second part, of, I'd just like to revisit one of the slides that I rushed over because I was concerned about time. But I, you've just heard this very eloquent expression of uh, a set of values uh, that enable people to live in harmony with one another and with Mother Earth. Um, and you talked about the importance of relationships. And what is travel, tourism, really about? It's about people meeting other people and forming a relationship. And we know in business even that you cannot have a transaction occur unless there's an element of trust. And you can, cannot have trust develop unless you've developed a relationship. So we are in the relationship business. We're actually in the encounter business not in the term, just pure transactions. And transactions only occur when that relationship has been established. But this is the kind of um, thinking, unfortunately, that we've been infused with in this Western dominant paradigm, this economic model, that guests are segments or demographics, and our job is to target them line them up in our sights, capture them, slaughter the competition, all right? Gain a share of their wallet. So when you walk in at the front desk, they're assessing you as to your potential spending power. And there are even some hotels that will find out if you tweet a lot. Because if you tweet a lot, you'll probably have more influence. So what is your influence? Power, and they'll give you a better room because you might tweet nice things about them. It's exploitative in that relationship. So different from the words you're using of respect, of love, of caring, of hospitality. Some of the worst organizations for extending hospitality are tourism organizations. <laughs> you know, I've spoken at a lot of conferences, and when I speak outside of tourism, I get treated like royalty. You speak in tourism? Oh, you're a consultant. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Ian. You know, but let's, be, let's speak the truth today about how things are. And as a result, in this system, it's an adversarial system. Look at all our, our government is an adversarial system. We have one party constantly you know, trying to compete with the other party. So there's no consensus about what is truth. There's only you're saying it this way, so we're going to have to say you did it wrong. It's constantly adversarial. Our government system is adversarial. Even our health care is adversarial. It's like we go to war on disease. We don't create healthy environments. We then go and slaughter, if you like, or try to kill anything that causes us any discomfort. We don't ask why the system might be out of balance. But in commerce, it's definitely an adversarial system. In tourism right now, both parties, the supplier and the buyer, are trying to get something at the cost of the other. We, as consumers, are constantly looking for the best deal. And we've created now these wonderful systems whereby we can constantly compare. We're trying to get it on the cheap. Similarly, suppliers are having to do everything they can to still maintain a, a margin. So they're reducing costs. They're not always delivering what they say in the brochure. So there's again, there's that adversarial approach and no one really benefits as a result. We have in tourism particularly this real sense of rugged individualism and independence. Not only have we got a mindset that says you as a customer is an object, but I as the host have got to go ahead and survive at all costs by myself because my competition's my my, my, my other hotel down the road. Do we work together collaboratively, collaboratively as a natural thing? No. And this is only because the mindset or the values and beliefs that we have been absorbed, often without questioning, are based on this notion that it's a doggy dog world out there. It's a, if I don't get there first, you will. Some cultures are worse than others um, on this, but generally speaking, Darwin, did a lot of damage. He also did, you know, I mean, he was a major part of our scientific understanding, but unfortunately what he didn't know 
was that, as exactly uh, Ben was saying, when you look at juvenile ecosystems, where a new uh, ecosystem is growing, competition is often dominant mode of behavior of species. But as ecosystems mature, and the vast majority of systems on the planet are actually very mature, an Amazon rainforest is an incredibly mature ecosystem, very complex, very finely tuned, finely balanced. Collaboration of species, and how each species can form, if you like, an environment for the other one, is by far the dominant mode of behavior. So maybe we human beings just simply have to grow up and become mature and start working together as opposed to this notion of I win, you lose. Everything is a resource for me to be to exploit. And similarly in tourism, we've taken that industrial model and we've chopped everything up. I talked about the different kinds of tourism, but we've chopped it up in terms of functions. Marketing, selling, product development, investment. We have all of these different ways of breaking things into silos. We have hotels, we have airlines, we have restaurants, we have, uh, and we all think we're separate and special and different. We don't think as family, as him, as you do in, your, in, in the indigenous culture. So we think we're disconnected from nature, so you can actually have a mindset that says, it's the economy, stupid. And unless we have jobs, and unless we're booming as an economy, we, don't, we can't take care of the environment. Well, excuse me, you get up, wait, the minute you wait, you're breathing right now, you're breathing a service of the environment. You're going to have a drink of water, that's a service of the environment. Without that, and without air, we don't live at all. So we haven't really understood that, connect, that connection and that dependence. And the tourism industry is actually quite bad in this sense that it is often... Um, I want to go back. All right. No, I don't want to do any of that. I don't understand the word of that. <clears throat> um, we've been quite bad at uh, not paying for all the services. We see a beautiful piece of real estate, a beach, <coughs> oh, a great hotel. Some local fishermen have been working there for thousands of years. Well, they can get out of the way. Um, but we've seen a resource that we can then exploit. So that's what I wanted to say. Just the language, just feel it, guys. Don't just think of it analytically. It just doesn't feel right, does it? And what Ben says lifts your spirits, it lifts your heart. That's why, the, in my opinion, the indigenous people have got so much to teach us. So I just wanted to go back and visit that and then very, very quickly <clears throat> um, take you uh, with some other, leave, leave you with some other thoughts. The biggest challenge, why are we doing this? I mean, we're not only doing it to help indigenous tourism businesses, but I'm saying as a community, a global humanity, we've got to find a way of ensuring that we can live in harmony, that our economy called tourism can, can return a, a proper, the highest and best return to the communities that host guests. So I'm talking about net benefit. Right now, the UNWTO, with all due respect, they count the gross benefit, they count the jobs, they count the revenues, but they don't count the cost, and we need to be honest about that. The second thing that I think, and this is where the word love comes, it was Alexander who said it. I, I thought Alexandra Cousteau's um, message was really powerful. But her grandfather had said, we don't protect what we don't love and we don't love what we don't know. So a really important role of tourism right now is to help our guests fall in love again with life and with the planet, with the beauty of this, and go home with a sense of wanting to protect it, understanding how fragile and how vulnerable it is. And tourism can play a role. And I went goosebumpy when I heard Taleb Rafai say, imagine if a billion, if we could influence a billion people on this planet, if every visitor we have goes home with that sense of connection, that gives a whole new meaning to tourism. Wouldn't you agree? I thought that was really in inspiring. Um, now, there are some incredibly welcome signs of change. Look at all of these different movements that are taking place in travel. And again, it reflects that mindset. We come up with a label and we put it in a box. 
So we have sustainable tourism, we have responsible tourism. And right now there are even arguments on the internet as to what the differences are. Now we can't afford to waste our time just, just arguing whether what's responsible isn't sustainable, etc., etc. The whole world's falling apart right now. Let's come together. But we've got some great things happening. We've got this local travel movement where people are really trying to encourage visitors to, to, um, and suppliers to buy local, for visitors to insist on there being local products to ensure the money's going into the community. There's a lady here who's involved in fair trade tourism, which is looking at the social side, making sure that people are not being exploited, that there is a decent living that you can have working in this industry, which you certainly can't have working in the cruise industry right now. We've got adventure travel now talking about protecting the culture and the resource. We have ecotourism, we have, as I say, geotourism is another one. Now this is all fantastic. The biggest challenge, however, is that because they're all in different boxes, they each look relatively small. But when you start to look at what unifies all of these initiatives, including indigenous tourism, then you realize that in actual fact, this is pretty close to mainstream. This is where the future lies, but it's actually already much bigger than most people think. And I would argue out of that, and out of discussions like ours, something new is emerging. And the two key, to me it's about us becoming conscious. The customers becoming conscious. As hosts we have to become conscious. And there are two key things that we really have to work on. And that is our values and our beliefs and what guides our businesses. We have to now start working from inside, from our hearts, to do what is, we know, the right thing. We have to work with our guests to help them see the world in a different way. Not as an object to be exploited, a destination to be done, a cheap deal to be had, but as a beautiful experience to be celebrated and valued. Because in the final analysis, if we don't turn the value around, this is the commercial piece of the discussion for those of you who are proud to be hard-nosed business people. If we cannot get that value back, the margins back to a healthy state, we won't have a viable industry going forward. So that's the mindset piece. And then the last piece, which is to me the most important, is the shift from product to the notion of a place. Every destination, whether it's in Estonia, it's Egypt, it's here in, um, in beautiful Lucerne, it's fabulous Nigeria, it's Bulgaria. It's unique. It's unique because it, it sits in a very unique point on the planet. The light is different, the sun rises at different times, the, 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 the soil is different, the, the, the geological shaping of that place is different, the history of its people is different. It is unique. Now, I tried to do economics at the university, and I was a big flop, especially when the graph started to do that. <laughs> but what I did understand, and I'm sure every one of you understand, that what is unique has more value than something that is everywhere, right? And yet in tourism, what we've done is we've made what is unique a commodity, which is everywhere. It's substitutable. And the biggest task that we could undertake right now is to learn how to celebrate and express the uniqueness of the place that our customers are coming to see at every step of their experience. And again, this is where I feel that the indigenous people have so much to teach us. That is putting that power of place, because that, that is your life, that is the air you breathe, you understand the notion of identity associated with the place, which we in tourism, with that old model, unfortunately have lost. So the practical things of what I think the indigenous, I think, and this is all my personal opinion, you may disagree. I think that there are some practical things that you can do to make a significant difference to the viability, vitality, health of tourism. And one is that helping in your community to help the tourism, the rest of the tourism community, what's often called the mainstream, although again, I don't like these labels, to really come to learn what makes that place special and what it means to you, and what it's meant to your ancestors, and what it could mean to them if they just took the time to slow down and really appreciate what makes it different 
It's the only antidote that exists to this thing called commodification. Secondly, to help slow down, to get involved in programs with your counterparts in, in tourism, to help their guests slow down and again savor the place. This is all of your experiential opportunities. Because if we can slow the visitor down and start to get in touch with their senses, start to observe the small as well as the big, to not rush through a place but actually interact with it, they'll stay longer and they'll value it more. And then thirdly, because of that experience, that ideally transformative experience, then people will go home and they will talk. And if they talk and share, they'll be influencers out there in the marketplace. And your reputation as a destination will grow. And you'll find over time, your ability to market and attract to people will actually, the costs and the effort required will go down. Because your customer's going to be bringing the good. So that's the sort of practical areas where it's really, if you like, this is about the bottom line. But on the other hand, I also say we do this for the greater good because of the situation we find ourselves as, as, a, as a civilization on the planet right now. We have to protect our future. If we cannot influence our customers to change the lens from the one that you've just seen over here that says, the earth is a lumberyard, I can take and make what I want and produce waste as much as I want and do this forever and ever, to one which is one of kinship, of reciprocity, of respect and of reverence, we're in deep, excuse my language, and may I take shit. <laughs> All right, we are, we're in deep trouble. And don't you try and pitch yourself, it isn't serious. And so to do that, we create these wonderful opportunities for wonder and awe. That's where, again, indigenous storytelling, indigenous ability to talk about the sun, the moon, the stars, in a language that really, 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 really gets to hear is really important. Ultimately, as Ben was saying, all life is sacred. And then finally, we can become the catalysts to make the tourism industry the change agents that we need. So finally, this to me is where it's at. This is, uh, I found this on the internet, but I mean, it's the Penan of Sarawak to understand, as you do, that all land is sacred. And when we have a sacred ecological mindset, um, we will transform tourism, and you're right on the front line, and I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And there's a quick one last slide, which I think Ben will appreciate, because this is actually in India who wrote this. If I could just read this, um, and this is what I'd love us all to take home. Why do we travel? Um, we travel to lose ourselves, we travel next to find ourselves. We travel to open our hearts and eyes and learn more than our newspapers will accommodate. But we travel in essence to become young fools again, to slow time down and get taken in and fall in love once more. Thank you.